So uh, we're going to have uh, Julia Basha is uh, uh, back on stage, and we'd like to uh, thank her for coming. Thank you for your wonderful team. Please take a seat. So you made a lot of movies on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and mostly on pacifists, as you, as you said already um, during the introduction. And I was thinking, um, how did you identify Naila? And why did you choose her, which uh, was uh, very active during the first Intifada, which is like 30 years ago now? Mm -hmm. yep. so if Thank you. I'm going to speak in English, but I believe there's simultaneous translation, which is an amazing thing that the festival provides that. So thank you for that. Um, when we started our work at Just Vision, which is a, a nonprofit organization based in East Jerusalem and New York and Washington, DC, our goal was to change the narrative about what was happening in Israel and Palestine. And so we've been, for the past 15 years, telling the stories of nonviolent resistance from the ground, to try to get people to focus on the individuals who share our values of pluralism and inclusion on the ground so that they can become more effective and grow as opposed to the violent actors. We did a lot of films that talked about people who are working today on the ground doing this work. And there are still many that are doing this work. But we wanted to make sure that there was no mistake about when nonviolent resistance happened. Because one of the challenges we face with our films, particularly with our film Budrus, was that many people reacted by saying, oh, finally, Palestinians discovered nonviolence. And that was a huge mistake and a huge problem. Because historically, Palestinians have used nonviolent resistance since the 1800s. And that's a history that has been invisible in their fight for recognition of their nationality. And the most um, exemplary moment of that history was the first intifada, which is largely misunderstood in the West, but also in Palestinian society. And those, mis those misunderstandings um, hit two main points. One uh, is about the methods that were used at the time. As I think you got a taste during this film, the First Intifada used classic examples of nonviolent resistance, like boycotts, like sit-ins, like protests, creation of parallel institutions, so building your own civil society in preparation for an independent state. And they managed to do that at a level that no other movement historically, the anti-apartheid movement or the civil rights movements, actually was able to do to the extent that they built an entire infrastructure of hospitals, schools, of security that was separate from the occupying military power at the time. We wanted to tell that story. Once I started researching the film, I learned that the reason why they were able to be so effective in building those institutions was because the women were the ones leading the underground resistance. And that is a story that Palestinians don't know today. And the reason why they don't know is because as you saw in the end of the film, they were pushed aside. And that was a tragedy and it's a travesty and has huge implications today for the possibility of a successful movement emerging in the region. Correcting narratives, correcting the history is critically important for informing how we move into the future. So this is why we decided it was really important to make this film. And this movie is also very personal on Naila's family and Naila's story. So you, you explain why you picked up these women, because sure. they were forgotten. Yeah. So Naila was the main figure? S sure. So um, I want to be very clear. Naila Yash was not the main leader, the main Palestinian women leader of the First Intifada. Um, there were thousands of women who did this work underground. It was a grassroots movement. It was very horizontal. 
and each one of these women deserve a film to be made about them. I interviewed 30 of them. They were not fully representative of everyone, but I tried as much as possible to understand them. I interviewed a lot of women from Gaza who still live in Gaza. Naila, of course, during the Intifada lived in Gaza, but she's currently living in Ramallah. I interviewed women from different political backgrounds, different social backgrounds, different generations, young, old, and Nyla emerged as the main story because as a filmmaker, I wanted to tie a personal story with the political story and try to make that flow through the beginning, middle, and end of the film. And her story allowed me to do that in a very effective way. She also, of course, among many of the other women, was the one who had some of the most harrowing and awful experiences in terms of experiencing a miscarriage under torture, in terms of having her husband sent away and deported without any possibility of returning. And in the meantime, she's arrested and she has a six month old baby that nobody can take care of. So that was also part of me showing how often women bear the brunt of resistance and how often women are targeted as part of being um, so much of the um, caretakers in their families. And um, across the world, this happens, where women are, are, are targeted and uh, the aspects of family are used against them to try to silence them. And Nyla really showed how that takes place, obviously not in Israel, around the world, and historically in many places. And how did you get the access to this very personal story? Because it's the, um, her son, which is, is kind of telling the story also. Yeah. And how did you build the trust with the family? Yes, it was really hard, actually, because Nyla was the most reluctant woman. She really didn't want to talk. Um, the experience was very traumatic to her. Her son did not want to talk to us for a long time. Uh, they just didn't want to open that up. And it was through the process of many conversations and getting uh, Nyla and the family to understand why we felt this was important that we managed to gain their trust. Um, just a couple of weeks ago, I had the opportunity to talk to Majd, who is Nyla's son, who lives in Canada today. And he saw the film a couple of weeks prior during a visit in Ramallah. We've had many screenings now on the ground and I wasn't present, so I didn't know how he had felt about the film, and he had not mentioned to his parents. Uh, and uh, I was quite worried about it, because I knew how reluctant he had been to talk about the film, to talk to us, and uh, I got, I even get nervous just thinking about how nervous I was. And I, I, um, I talked, I you know, talked, and, um, and he said, you know, for a long time, um, most of my adult life, I've been trying to get my mom uh, to do therapy for what she experienced and the trauma, and she's always refused. And now I see that this film has become her therapy. And that was not something I expected at all as an outcome of this film, but uh, since the film came out, Nyla has become an incredibly open person. She has been coming to film festivals and screenings and talking about it, and has regained the confidence and the strength uh, that her son uh, clearly sees happening. He, he was tremendously moved and uh, very grateful to see that feminist history uh, finally um, getting light into the world. Congratulations, you, you made something happen for Naila. Nice, now I, I will let you ask your question. I'm pretty sure you have a lot of questions, so I give you... You have to raise your hand. La, madame. Thank you. Thank you so much for this film. I learned personally a lot of things. I did not know at all that what women did. At, we, we just heard about Infada and, and the horrible things, but I've never knew what the woman did, and it's really wonderful to hear this. How is the situation today? Mm. As we saw, and I mean, a lot of things have happened and not good things. Are uh, women still, could they do really things which helps to, to get peace at all? Thank you for your question. 
Um, the situation has unfortunately deteriorated uh, since then pretty dramatically, both in terms of uh, women's rights inside Palestinian society, as well as uh, the repressive system of uh, the occupation. I mean, at this point, um, every aspect of Palestinian life uh, is uh, controlled and, and monitored by the military authorities. Uh, Gaza continues to be uh, encircled by uh, military power, except of course on the border with Egypt, which is currently, um, there's, there's again coordination directly between the Egyptian government and the Israeli military, so it's de facto controlled by the Israeli military. And uh, it's extremely hard for uh, Palestinian women in that environment. Uh, Aza, Qasim, and Naima El Sheikh, who you met in the film, you might not remember their names, but Aza is, is a, a very ebullient uh, woman who talked about how um, the man, the Palestinian man said, your role is done. And Naima El Sheikh is the woman who wears uh, the headscarf. And they are still living in Gaza today. They are incredibly active on the ground for women's rights, and they have a very active group among them, uh, and also in organizing against the occupation. Uh, similarly, uh, Naila Ayash and uh, Zahira Kamal, who you saw, is uh, the only uh, Palestinian female head of a political party. Uh, currently, they remain tremendously active, so against all odds and against all of uh, different types of repression that they face, they continue struggling but they face a really uh, significant degree of invisibility. And so a lot of the work that we are trying to do is making sure that people know that there are Palestinian-led nonviolent movements happening on the ground, that these women need their support, they need the platforms, they need the connections, uh, they need the security that comes with international support and visibility. Um, and we hope that this film can start being part of that conversation. I will also say that um, in screenings, so we've been showing the film um, in the Palestinian territories, and the film is becoming a, a very important tool for the women on the ground, because the first intifada remains among Palestinians uh, a moment of great pride. Uh, and now that they are discovering <laughs> through this film that their moment of greatest pride came through the hard work of women, uh, there is some pretty significant rethinking to be done about what's the process for liberation. And, uh, and I think the conversation is going to go in the direction that, you know, you can't have national liberation without women's liberation, and they go hand in hand. One question here. Yes, yes, in the front row. Uh, uh, yes, uh, yes, good afternoon. Yes, uh, good afternoon, and congratulations for the film. Very special moment. So here's my question. We well know that uh, the uh, Israeli government is uh, governed by a religious uh, uh, extreme right uh, government, and uh, the objective of Israel is not to uh, negotiate. Uh, but we also know that there's a, a women's movement in Israel for peace. So have, were you able to show this film in Israel? And if yes, uh, what was the impact if you were able to actually screen this film you know, from the uh, Israeli society? What was their reaction? Thank you so much for your question. Um, so Just Vision, the nonprofit organization that I mentioned earlier, has a currently a two-pronged strategy. One is our films and community engagement and impact with the films. And then we have a Hebrew language website called Sicha Mekomit, which in English translates to local call. That was a strategy that we decided on three years ago in order to reach directly the Israeli public without having to go through the Israeli media, which was um, uh, uh, really uh, you know, changing the messaging that we were trying to get before it actually reached the Israeli public. Siha uh, Mekomit reaches 2.5 million unique uh, readers in Israel in a country that uh, has 8 million people. So it's a very large portion of the population. And we are going to be releasing the film through that platform online so that we can reach Israelis directly and we can reach that many people. So millions of people are going to be able to have access uh, to that film. And we have an Israeli team on the ground, uh, Yael Morom and Hagai Matar, um, who are in, them, in and of themselves incredible activists. Hagai Matar um, was, is the Israeli 
um, who served the longest term in prison in Israel for refusing army service. Uh, there is a, a long tradition uh, of that in Israel, and he is an extremely um, committed and incredible organizer in addition to being a beautiful writer and a journalist. And he's leading um, our campaign on the ground uh, and uh, will ensure that uh, Israelis can see the film and beyond the choir, beyond already um, Israelis who are already progressive and committed to peace um, and, and really sort of thinking through what are the right strategies, what are the points of pressure, how does change actually happens because we need to be very careful about empty talk about peace and wanting peace, and we actually need to talk about how do we create pressure on a situation where the power is very asymmetrical. This is not a conflict between two countries that have an army. This is a country between, uh, this is a conflict between uh, an occupying force and an occupied people. And in that, you need to be very conscious of that. Um, I believe that, um, uh, the way we're going to move forward the most effectively is through a Palestinian-led nonviolent resistance campaign and Israeli-supported. And that way, um, similarly to what we saw in the Intifada, you can create a political climate international, internationally where politicians can act. George Bush Sr. is a Republican, and he was the one who actually took the strongest stance historically in the United States about saying, Human rights matter. We are not going to allow our uh, American tax dollars, $3 billion, to go towards a country that is committing such harsh human rights violation against the Palestinian people. And it's only with that financial pressure that Israel is going to change. So it's important that the movement on the ground be very strategic about how it's going forward um, with uh, uh, creating change on the ground. Yes, so two questions here and another question in the front row. So we're going to start on the left. Uh, yes, hello. I just wanted to say that um, thank you very much for your film. I believe that you shed a lot of light onto uh, the, histor the history pretty much of what had happened during the first intifada and as well from a woman's point of view, hopefully from one generation to the new generation mm -hmm. now for today, which is very important, especially when we talk about women's rights internationally. So thank you very much. And my question is, is with what is going on today and what has happened historically, because we need to learn from history as history does repeat itself mm -hmm. and we can learn a lot. What would you say we can do in terms of change um, based on, for example, the situation going on with the move of the embassy, for example, to Jerusalem, which is a very big topic today, mm -hmm. and which could definitely take away from peace talks and a, a potential uh, solution to, for peace for both countries and both, um, both parties of this conflict. And what I, would, what I was wanting to know would be, what is the solution today? What would be, uh, the concrete technique into... Sure, thank you. Uh, so a couple of things. Uh, peace talks are dead. Let's just start with that. Let's just be very clear. The peace process, as we have been talking about it, um, have been really just a travesty uh, from when it got taken over by the Oslo process. Peace processes need to have buy-in from civil society. If civil society is not involved in the peace process, there is no way for there to be long-term peace. There's also really in incredible research that has been done across the world looking at conflict zones that say that unless women are involved in peace process and in conversations and a dialogue at a high level, that it's really hard for those processes to lead to long-term stability and peace in the region and democratic institutions. Um, so the way that we've been talking about these peace talks and like, oh, did the peace talks break down? Oh, peace talks restart. Oh, there they go to Annapolis again. And, oh, it broke down. That's all irrelevant. That's noise, noise. And we need to really, and to be honest, um, and what I'm gonna say might, might sound 
kind of crazy maybe to some people, but I actually find the, the silver lining of the Trump administration and their uh, harsh and completely irresponsible decision to announce that they're gonna move the Israeli embassy to Jerusalem is that it drops that mask. The mask is gone. We know now clearly the United States is not as it currently stands and in the current political dynamics that exist in Congress, a viable, honest broker for peace. And that needs to be very clearly stated. Since Madrid, and in Madrid, the United States was an honest broker. It actually was seriously taking human rights into account as part of negotiations. It hasn't been the case since Oslo. So we've been living in this fantasy, basically. Um, I don't find that the, the actual move to, of the Jerusalem embassy is going to impact significantly the life of Palestinians living in East Jerusalem. The movement of settlement construction and the displacement and basically um, a, a serious ethnic displacement of Palestinians happening, a trend that has accelerated over the years and nobody has cared about it and nobody has paid attention to it. Um, and now, you know, uh, Trump announces he's going to move to Jerusalem and everybody's like, oh, how terrible. <laughs> really? This has been happening progressively for years already. Um, this, you know, the, 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 the things that sometimes the international community is terrified about um, is, is really has no connection with the experience of the people on the ground. Um, so I would say that what is, what's most important in terms of our uh, sort of the international community is to start really paying attention to what's happening at the grassroots level and understanding the dynamics on the ground and who are the people that are uh, thinking strategically about what are the pressure points. Nonviolent resistance depends really on international support and international pressure. The way it works is that people on the ground activate, they mobilize, they create demands for the international community to take on and then the international community becomes active and responds to that and creates a political climate in their own countries that politicians can then act and create policy change. And this is the movement that I think we need to be following and focusing instead of um, paying attention to whether, uh, you know, Bush, uh, sorry, Trump is going to now restart peace talks. Are the Palestinians going to join the peace talks? Which peace talks? This is not a reality right now. Uh, so that would be my, my recommendation. Thank you very much. So thank you, Julia. I'm sorry, we're running out, out of time already, but I thank you very much for being here, for your wonderful film and for your presence and you believe in peacemaking towards Pacific um, activism. So we know what we have to do now. <laughs> thank you so much. And now I will invite Leo to introduce the second part of the event. Thank you very much.